Good evening. My name is Bruce Margon. I'm on the faculty in the astronomy department here at the University of Washington. And this evening I'm going to discuss with you a very ambitious project that's involved more than 100 scientists and engineers worldwide to make the first ever digital encyclopedia of the entire sky. When this project is over, most of us will have worked on it for at least 10 years. Some of us will have worked on it for almost 15 years. So it's a reasonable question to ask, why in the world do we want to do this? Why do we want to devote a large fraction of our entire adult lives to this kind of project? And the answer is that we intend to learn the answers to some of the most fundamental questions about the structure and evolution of our universe. We actually know an amazing amount about how our universe began. In fact, as crazy as it seems, it is plausible that we understand more about the first five minutes of the lifetime of our universe than we understand about the common cold. Now that's a very ambitious claim. In fact, some might say that's a very arrogant or audacious claim, but it's true. The universe started with a huge explosion some 12 to 15 billion years ago, starting from a very, very compact state and steadily expanding since then, becoming ever larger and ever more dilute. Well, how do we know this? How can we tell? The basic unit of structure in our universe today is the galaxy of stars. This is a picture of a galaxy of some 200 billion separate stars. It's what we think our own galaxy, the Milky Way, would look like if we could step outside, look back, and take a photograph. These 200 billion stars are so close together that they overexpose the photograph here and all merge into one glow. But they're individual particles trapped by their own gravitational tug on each other, swirling around in a pinwheel, unable to get away from each other. And our universe is full of these galaxies. They go on and on and on. The more and more sensitive photographs that we take of the celestial sphere, the more and more galaxies like this we see. I'm going to show you now the most sensitive image of the sky ever seen by man. This is an exposure made by the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting from above the Earth's atmosphere. A time exposure where the shutter was opened for 10 consecutive days and light was just allowed to build up and build up and build up, exposing ever fainter, ever fainter, ever fainter galaxies. Virtually every image that you see on this photograph is a galaxy of 200 billion separate stars. The light from some of these images has been en route to us for almost the entire 15 billion year lifetime of the universe. The universe is in motion. These galaxies are all moving with respect to each other. Now before I tell you how I know this, I might tell you that actually any one of you here could have predicted that this would be so. And why is that? Well, these galaxies are just made of stars and gas, which are in turn just made of individual atoms. And the law of gravity is such that every atom in every star in every galaxy is tugging on every other atom in every star in every galaxy throughout the universe. The force of gravity is actually infinite in range. It just gets weaker and weaker and weaker as things get further and further apart, but it never shuts off entirely. So in fact, consider the alternative to a universe in motion. That is, consider the possibility that all these galaxies were exactly stationary. If that were so, that would mean that every galaxy in the universe had been arranged so that the attraction of every atom in every star in every galaxy for every atom in every star in every other galaxy throughout the entire universe balanced just perfectly and nothing moved. If that were the kind of universe we lived in, it would almost be like a house of cards standing on edge. It would be incredibly fragile. If anything changed, it would be a disaster. I mean, you'd be afraid to walk a few feet over, right? Because then the gravitational attraction of you, of everything else would change and the whole universe might collapse and it would be your fault. So in fact, one could argue that um, your intuition alone would tell you that the universe should be somehow in motion. Maybe that doesn't tell you whether it's expanding or contracting or whatever, but one might guess it would be moving. That's not a trivial conclusion, by the way, because Einstein thought through this problem and arrived at the opposite conclusion. He actually liked the idea of a stationary universe. But in fact, um, we can directly observe that the universe is in motion. We don't need to use this uh, more indirect reasoning. We, we can actually see observational evidence. 
Now, we do not see evidence that galaxies, the individual blobs on these photographs, are actually crawling across the photograph. The universe is such a large place that even at very high velocities, it takes galaxies vastly longer than a human lifetime to move a perceptible amount. And so our observational evidence that galaxies are moving is not due to watching them creep across a photograph. Rather, it's due to a somewhat more devious observation that is going to permeate everything I talk about this evening. So we're, we'll take uh, two or three minutes off and talk about some basic physics. When you look up at the sky and you see stars, they just look like little white dots. It doesn't look like they have much information in them other than that little white dot. But in fact, that seemingly white light has a tremendous amount of information contained inside of it. If you take white light and pass it through a prism, and put up a piece of cardboard on the other side of a prism, I think you all know that what you get back out is a rainbow of colors. And the physicist calls this rainbow the spectrum of the light. And this process of sorting the light out into its constituent colors is called taking the spectrum or spectroscopy. The same thing is true of starlight. Seemingly white starlight, in fact, contains inside of it a range of different colors. And the astronomer can take the spectrum of the star by focusing starlight through a telescope, passing it through a prism like this, separating it out into its component colors, and recording the result either on a cardboard screen or on a piece of photographic film, for example. Here is that process done for the brightest naked eye star in the sky, Sirius. This is Sirius, so pay attention now. What you see here is the light of Sirius passed through a prism and projected onto a cardboard screen. And you see that even though it looks sort of white to your eye, you do see a whole range of different colors in it. But I hope that you can also see that there are these odd looking gaps in the spectrum. There are places where the film was not exposed, where Sirius provided no light, even though you dispersed the light out into all its component colors. These missing places are called absorption lines. For a change, that's a term that makes some sense in physics, right? Because they're linear features and the light was absorbed. For some reason, it didn't reach us. And it turns out that these absorptions are caused by atoms in the upper layer of the star, Sirius, that are intercepting light at certain specific colors. A collision occurs between the outgoing light from the star and the atoms in the upper layer of the star. And if the light happened to be unlucky enough to have certain particular colors, or the physicist calls them wavelengths or frequencies, the atoms in the star gobble up that light and don't let it get to us. Now, this absorption process is a fundamental process of atomic physics. It just depends on the structure of the hydrogen atom. The absorptions that we're seeing here are due to hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe, in the upper layer of the star. And a physicist can look at a spectrum like this, and after he or she has seen a dozen or a hundred or a thousand of them, either from stars or just test tubes of hydrogen gas in the laboratory, that pattern becomes recognizable because it's always the same. It just depends on fundamental atomic parameters like the charge on the electron and the mass of the proton and things like that. And so in some sense, the place where those gaps are is a fingerprint of the absorbing atom. It's sort of the telephone number of the hydrogen atom, so to speak. And if a, another astronomer arrived late for this lecture and looked up at that spectrum, he or she would say, oh, that's the spectrum of hydrogen. I recognize that pattern of gaps. Now, um, one can talk about taking the spectrum of an entire galaxy of stars, not just a single star. Because after all, a galaxy of stars is just 200 billion stars that cause a, a merged image on a photograph. And so if you add together the light of 200 stars, all of which look like Sirius, and disperse it into a spectrum, what you end up seeing is a spectrum like Sirius. So the spectrum of an entire galaxy actually looks just like the spectrum of an individual star. It's just brighter because it's the sum of a very large number of stars. And so I equally well could have said that this is the spectrum of a galaxy, and the astronomers in the group would say, yeah, that's, that's probably right. The first comprehensive study of the spectra of galaxies occurred only in, in about 1920 when large telescopes came into operation in Southern California. And this fellow, Edwin Hubble, became famous for studies that he made of the spectra of galaxies. He's shown here at the 48-inch telescope of the Palomar Observatory. Hubble was born in 1889, died in 1953, and is responsible for many fundamental discoveries in extra-galactic astronomy. 
The work that he did on taking spectra of galaxies, however, really has to be shared with several other astronomers whose names have sort of been uh, lost to history, people like uh, Vesto Slipher, hardly a household word. But at any rate, uh, in the 1920s, Hubble, working with Slipher, obtained the spectra of numerous galaxies outside of our Milky Way, recognized these characteristic absorption lines, and realized that he was just seeing the sum of 200 billion stars in an individual galaxy, but also noticed that the absorption lines were displaced ever so slightly from the familiar pattern, rather occurring in slightly redder colors of light than he had learned to expect from nearby stars like Sirius. So he saw the normal pattern of a strong absorption and then a gap and then a weak absorption and then another one and a gap and so on, but it was ever so slightly shifted from the correct place where he had learned to expect. And Hubble correctly realized what was going on. Light, like sound or water waves, is a wave phenomenon, and the apparent color or frequency or wavelength of light can be shifted if there is motion between the source of light and the observer of light. This effect is familiar to us with sound, for example, um, because when a train goes across a crossing, the whistle, which is after all making a pure tone, suddenly makes a very sharp change in its perceived tone as the train first approaches you and then goes away. There is motion between you, the listener, and the train whistle, which is the source, and so this is a perceptual change of wavelength. There's no violation of physics. And indeed, we call this effect the Doppler effect. It works for all light, whether it's water waves or sound waves or light waves. And if there is recession between the observer of the wave and the emitter of the wave, there is a shift of this pattern ever so slightly to the red. If there's approach, there's a shift ever so slightly to the blue. Hubble and Slipher discovered that the spectra of all galaxies, all of them, have a red shift. That is, every galaxy external to our Milky Way, except for one or two neighbors who are wandering around, hovering nearby, are receding from our own galaxy. And this discovery, that our universe is expanding, is arguably one of the most important observational discoveries in physics in this century. I've had several students in Astronomy 101, when asked to describe Hubble's discovery, reply on a final examination, Hubble discovered that all galaxies are moving away from our Milky Way. Can you blame them? Well, in fact, an observer on any other galaxy in the universe would also find the same effect that Hubble found. That is, we are not in any special position. The entire fabric of the universe is growing larger. Every observer on every galaxy sees nothing but red shifts in every other galaxy that he or she looks at. But of course, what this phenomenon of Doppler shifts of galaxy spectra tells us is it provides direct evidence that the universe is in motion. We don't have to make this indirect inference that, well, it's unlikely that gravity balances out. Rather, we can actually observe the recession of galaxies from us. Um, the the uh, Doppler shift is really quite familiar to you in everyday life, although, of course, much more familiar in the context of sound, as I've mentioned already. This is a cartoon by Sidney Harris, a wonderful cartoonist who makes fun of scientists. For, for those of you who are too far from the screen, I'll read you the caption. The, the two cowboys are saying to each other, I love hearing that lonesome wail of the train whistle as the magnitude of the frequency of the wave changes due to the Doppler effect. So these are two cowboys who've taken a basic course in physics and, and understood very well what Hubble was talking about. Well, other than proving that the universe is in motion, what else do Hubble and Slipher's observations tell us? Well, by measuring the speed with which the universe is expanding today, we actually obtain a clue to the age of the universe. Why is that? Well, if we know through measurements of the amount of the redshift how fast today's universe is expanding, we can mentally play the movie backwards. We can realize in our head that, well, yesterday's universe must have been a little smaller. All the galaxies were a little bit closer together. And a week ago, the universe was smaller still. And a year ago, the universe was smaller still, and so on. Indeed, measuring the rate of expansion of the universe today allows us to know how fast to play the movie backwards. And by that trick, we can reasonably accurately estimate when the entire universe must have been crammed into an arbitrarily small volume, when the universe as we know it must have begun. And the answer to that is somewhat uncertain because it depends upon the accuracy with which you measure the expansion rate, 
but today we believe it is of order 12 to 15 billion years. And this is the reason for my saying that we really understand quite well that the universe has a finite age and began about 15 billion years ago. In fact, we can even follow the physics of the universe backwards as we play the movie backwards. As the universe grows slightly smaller, all the galaxies are, of course, crammed into a slightly smaller space, so the universe becomes a little denser. They're the same number of atoms in a smaller volume. And as we follow this evolution, we discover that the universe becomes smaller and denser, smaller and denser, smaller and denser. And as we step back through that 12 to 15 billion years or so, we can actually calculate and write down what all the basic physical parameters of the universe were at any given time. We can tell you. Uh, how hot it was, how dense it was, whether um, most of the energy in the universe was locked up in matter, or whether it was locked up in light, and so on. Well, of course, there must be a limit, you, you might say. The, the universe can't get arbitrarily small, and, and we still be able to tell you exactly what was going on. Indeed, there is a limit to our physical understanding of the very early, small, compact universe. But that limit occurs an astonishingly short time after the Big Bang. That is, we can play the movie backwards virtually all the way to the Big Bang. In astronomy, we use lots of big numbers and also lots of small numbers. So for the next few moments, we're going to talk about some very small numbers. So how far can we play the movie backwards? We can play the movie backwards to the first one second before the Big Bang. Now, at that time, every atom in every galaxy, in every originally star, was crammed in an extremely small volume. And so indeed, there were no individual galaxies, there were no individual stars, there were no individual atoms. There was just a soup of nuclear particles. But we can write down the density and temperature of the universe at that age of one second. We can play the movie backwards even further. The numbers now start to get rather small. We can play the movie backwards to one one hundredth of a second. And still, our laws of physics allow us to calculate the size of the universe, the temperature of the universe, the density of the universe. We can play the movie backwards to one one hundredth, thousandth of a second. And we still have the correct physics to, with some confidence, be able to calculate the temperature of the universe, the size of the universe, the density of the universe. It's just the same number of atoms around today crammed into a much smaller volume. Well, where does this stop? Where do we run out of knowledge? Where do we throw up our hands and say, I don't know how to calculate that anymore? Is it one millionth of a second after the Big Bang? One hundred millionth of a second? One hundred billionth of a second? Actually, it's one over one followed by 43 zeros of a second after the Big Bang. We can calculate backwards that far before our physics breaks down. This ridiculously tiny instant after the Big Bang has a name, because everything in physics has a name. It's called the Planck time. And this is the time when we finally realize that physics is not up to the job anymore. Technically, the issue then is that we lack a quantum theory of gravity, and you simply cannot follow the laws of physics for denser times. At that time, however, the universe is impressively small. So I don't think we need, should apologize. We should, in fact, smile in triumph. At this instant, 1 over 1 followed by 43 zeros after the Big Bang, the entire universe, every atom in every star in every galaxy, is the size of this marble. And we can say that with some confidence. Someone like the entire universe? Careful, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> so how can, we, how can we possibly know this? I mean, it just it seems like the, the height of arrogance to say that with some confidence, we, we can calculate something this esoteric. But as the English astrophysicist Martin Rees has pointed out, the early universe was actually extremely simple because there was not a diversity of content, but rather there were only extremely fundamental particles, a very, very large number of them, but they were all the same. And so if you can calculate the condition of one of them, you can calculate the condition of every particle in the universe. Amusingly enough, the thing that is impossibly complex to calculate is something like the structure of a tree or the human brain, something like that, because there's a, a tremendous diversity of atomic states in it. So it's not really that crazy to claim that we can follow the structure of the universe back that far. However, before we pat ourselves on the back too much for how brilliant we are about this, it's probably important to point out the things that we don't know. 
And it's the things that we don't know about the evolution of the universe that have led us to start this project to make this digital encyclopedia of the sky. Now, I've just finished um, pointing out that the early universe was very, very simple. It was so dense that everything was mashed into an enormously uniform soup. The Big Bang is sort of the ultimate cosmic Cuisinart. It made the universe into a totally smooth pudding. But, of course, when we look around the universe today, we see that the universe is anything but smooth. Rather, it's extremely lumpy. We have these galaxies of 200 billion stars and then vast distances of empty space in between them and then other galaxies of 200 billion stars and so on. And so somehow, in the 15 billion years between the Big Bang and today, the universe evolved from this perfectly, exquisitely smooth lump into something that is very chaotic and not at all smooth. How did that happen? We really have no idea. The dignified term to put on this problem is the issue of the evolution of structure in the universe. And so the first problem that the group of colleagues and I are setting out to challenge is this issue of how did structure in the universe evolve. And you can begin to get an idea, I hope, that to answer that problem, one tool that we need is an accurate map of the universe. We observe that today's universe is very, very lumpy and intricately structured. We'd like to be able to mathematically measure that lumpiness to great accuracy. So there is one motivation for constructing an accurate encyclopedia, to examine the evolution of structure. Let me talk about a second independent motivation, which is perhaps even more uh, worrisome if you think about it a little bit. I've made this grandiose claim that we know the universe began 15 billion years ago. We can follow the detailed physics back to just 10 to the minus 43 seconds, the briefest instant of a gnat's eye after the explosion. But it's just human nature to ask what came before that. And indeed, the most uh, pressing and obvious question to most of us, I think, would be, well, if the universe has a finite age, 15 billion years, how did it decide to start, right? Who said, okay, go? Who turned the key? Why then? Why 15 billion years ago? Was it sitting around for an arbitrary long interval of time before then? It seems incredible that we might actually have an answer to this. But theoretical physicists believe that they may be on the beginnings of an answer that have to do with esoteric shimmerings of the very most fundamental subnuclear structures. Esoteric shimmerings doesn't sound like a very dignified term, so the physicist calls these quantum fluctuations. Oddly enough, it appears that there is some chance that these quantum fluctuations of the primordial material, just by chance, eventually had to lead to the violent expansion. Now, if you're like me, you'd say, Sure, right? And I, I have a bridge I want to sell you too. But actually, this theory that the Big Bang emerged out of these individual fluctuations of the tiniest subnuclear matter has a consequence, which is the pattern of those fluctuations in the tiniest universe at the instant of the Big Bang, in fact, becomes frozen in to the expansion. And the lumpiness that is thought to perhaps have started the Big Bang should still reflect itself mathematically in the lumpiness of today's universe. So the theoretical physicist believes that if we could somehow, in a grand census, quantify exactly how lumpy today's universe is, he or she could extrapolate that lumpiness all the way back to the instant of the Big Bang and tell you whether or not those fluctuations could actually have started the explosion. Clearly, to be able to challenge this theory, again, we want an accurate census of the universe, a mathematically precise map. And so that is perhaps one of the second motivations that has led us to undertake this census. There's a third entirely unrelated problem that wants us, uh, that makes us curious about the intricate structure of the universe. And it's perhaps the most embarrassing problem of all of any that I've discussed so far. If we look at nearby galaxies, like this one, and again, this is a spiral galaxy like our Milky Way. It's like what we would probably look like if we could get outside and take a picture. We discover that these galaxies are themselves not stationary. That is, not only 
Are they participating in the expansion of the universe that Hubble and Slipher discovered? But the individual stars within each galaxy are also in motion. And again, I might claim that you could have predicted that because the force of gravity is relentless. Every atom and every star of the 200 billion stars in that galaxy is pushing on every atom, on every other star, attracting every atom and every other star. And so you could look at that and say, well, if gravity never turns off, if every atom in all 200 billion stars is attracting every other atom in all 200 billion stars, how does it hold itself up? Why do you see this grand pinwheel? Why doesn't the whole thing just collapse? And indeed, that's a very good question to ask. That we can answer. The answer is that the whole pinwheel is rotating ever so slowly and grandly, rotating around. And so there's a centrifugal force that is trying to push stars to the outside that is counteracting the gravitational balance of the galaxy to collapse. It's the exact same answer to why the Earth does not fall into the sun. Because the Earth is rotating around the sun, there's a centrifugal force pushing the Earth outwards that's exactly balanced by the gravitational attraction of the sun inwards, and everything stays put. So for many, many years, we believed the answer to why don't these galaxies collapse, which after all is a pretty important question to us because we live in one, was simply the rotation exactly and elegantly balances the gravitational force. However, if that's true, as you examine stars that get further and further and further and further away from the fat part of a galaxy, what, of course, you should see is that the force of gravity on them is getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And so those stars should be moving more and more and more sluggishly and slowly. They don't have to fight very hard to keep from falling in because they're much further away from the source of gravitational attraction. These days, we can actually do this experiment by taking spectra of stars on the outskirts of external galaxies and measuring how hard are they fighting back. Is this balance, which we infer, actually workable? Are they rotating at the right speed? And when you do this, you discover a very upsetting result, which is that stars way out in the suburbs of these galaxies, which should need to move only ever so slowly to stay up there, are in fact moving around at a very rapid clip, far faster than they ought to be given how heavy we believe the galaxies are. Indeed, the motions of stars in the external parts of galaxies and our own galaxy as well seem to indicate that galaxies weigh vastly more than we actually thought. On the other hand, we can see, we can count up the number of stars that are radiating in a given galaxy, and we find these two parameters are out of balance. Most of the gravitational tug of galaxies comes from things that do not make light. Apparently, most of the matter in galaxies is dark. And again, for a change using a term that makes some good sense, we call this the problem of dark matter. Most of the gravitational attraction in the universe is coming from matters from matter that is not contained in stars. Well, you might say, well, okay, so we're not infinitely smart. How bad is this problem? If it were sort of 2% or 5% or 10% of the mass of the galaxy is not accounted for in stars, we'd say, well, okay, that's something for the next generation of astronomers to work on. But the problem is much worse than that. The amount of this dark matter is somewhat ambiguous. It's a little tricky to measure, but there are some measurements that suggest that 99% of the matter in the universe may be dark. That stars, planets, glowing gas account for only 1% of the matter in the universe. Now you see that suddenly we get a lot more interested. What this means, of course, is that everything that astronomers have studied for hundreds of years, planets, stars, galaxies, gas, is just a footnote in the constituency of the universe 99% of the material may be something we don't know about yet. Is it made of atoms? Maybe, but maybe not. There are, in fact, some theories that say that this dark matter is not even constructed of the basic building blocks that we know about, namely atoms, but rather perhaps of far more esoteric particles. Well, the one thing that this dark matter does do, even if it doesn't make light, is it creates gravitational attraction. That's, after all, how we noticed it. The rotation rates of these galaxies are wrong. So the whole universe may be permeated with this stuff. We may not be able to see it. We may not be able to know what it's made of, but we can watch its gravitational effects. 
We can count galaxies. We can look at the distribution of galaxies on the sky and see how they are responding to this invisible dark matter. So yet a third motivation to make a census of the celestial sphere, to try and get some understanding of what this stuff is. So all three of these fundamental problems which I have discussed are compelling reasons to make a very, very detailed encyclopedia of the distribution of galaxies on the sky. To review the three issues, how did the large-scale structure of the universe emerge? How did we get from this perfectly smooth Big Bang to the lumpy universe we see today? The second issue is, could it be true that microscopic fluctuations actually triggered the Big Bang? And do we see those fluctuations grown into the grand pattern of the universe today? And the third issue, what is the dark matter? What is most of the mass of the universe made of? Can we use the distribution of visible galaxies to trace this? For all of these reasons, we have decided to try and make this grand map. Now, actually, it's a lot easier to theorize about this mathematically than to actually build the tools to do it. You can, of course, do this experiment theoretically in a computer. You can put a bunch of galaxies into a computer, set the laws of gravity working, hypothesize a certain kind of dark matter, and sort of see what happens, see how the structure of the universe evolves. And the theorist sort of has life easy because uh, he or she can run the uh, computer as fast as they want to. Um, I'm going to show you now a video done by a graduate student here at the University of Washington, Joachim Stadel, that is this theoretical study of evolution of structure in the universe from the time of the Big Bang. If we could roll the video, please. Certain assumptions are made about the nature of the dark matter, how violently the expansion of the universe began, and the universe starts to expand. About a billion years is going by every second here, and you see that the universe is getting lumpier and lumpier and lumpier and lumpier. The rotating cube is just for effect, to let you look at the universe better. It's not the implication that the universe is actually rotating. It plays over and over again now. So you just saw the Big Bang start again, a relatively smooth universe, just gravity working now, attracting different galaxies, and the structure gets lumpier, irregular, filamentary, voids appear, and so on. And interestingly enough, as you change the parameters of the Big Bang, as you put more or less dark matter in, as you put more or less total amount of matter in the universe made of atoms, as you change the expansion speed of the universe, how filamentary and clumpy the resulting universe is changes. So these theoretical calculations are a very compelling motivation for us to actually go out and measure this, try and very, very accurately measure the distribution of galaxies and compare them with these theoretical models and learn something about the ratio of dark matter to bright matter in the universe and so on. These computer calculations tell us this can work if we could just make these measurements. Well, how would we go about making this very detailed measurement of the structure of the universe? You notice that the video that we showed you, of course, was in three dimensions, because, of course, our universe is in three dimensions. So we need to know in all three dimensions where a huge number of galaxies are. Well, the first two dimensions are simple. We can take a picture of the sky, and we can measure where galaxies are, you know, a little bit up, a little bit to the right, and so on. That one's a little bit to the left, a little bit down, and so on. So the two-dimensional location of galaxies is not that esoteric to do. You just have to photograph a very large number of them. But we also need the third dimension. We want to fill out this whole cube. Well, what is the third dimension? The third dimension on a photograph, of course, is not how much to the left or right, or how much up and down. It's how far away is the galaxy. And that is a lot more difficult to estimate. After all, when you, we've been looking at these pictures of these beautiful, uh, majestic galaxies, how do we know how far away they are? We really have no idea. We might guess that the small, faint ones are kind of far away, and the large, bright ones are kind of close, but that is hardly a, a very specific census. So we need some mechanism to accurately measure the distance, the third dimension in a census. Hubble solved that problem for us, too. Hubble and Slipher found that not only do all galaxies show redshifts, but there is a pattern to these redshifts. And in fact, it's a rather simple pattern, which you can notice just looking at a few of these galaxies for which Hubble and Slipher obtained spectra. Um, it turns out that in many galaxies, the most prominent absorption lines, the most prominent gaps, come not from the hydrogen atom, but from the calcium atom. It just has to do with the average temperature of most of the stars in that galaxy. The very strongest absorption lines in our own sun, by the way, are a pair of lines due to the calcium atom. And the astronomer calls them calcium H and K. And you see there are these two little gaps right here, these two little absorptions in this bright spectrum of a galaxy. 
here's a galaxy that we might guess is a little further away because it's smaller and a little fainter. Indeed, when you look at the spectrum of that galaxy, here is the pair of two bright absorptions from calcium H and K, but you notice they're shifted more to the red. Hubble was able to calculate that whereas this galaxy has a very small shift, the velocity of recession is 1,200 kilometers per second, this other galaxy, which appears to be further away, has a larger shift. If you go to yet a smaller and fainter galaxy, you discover that the little pair of lines is shifted even more to the red. That is, Hubble found that not only do all galaxies recede from us with a red shift, but apparently the amount of that shift is related to the distance of the galaxy in a simple and linear way. The further away the galaxy, the greater the red shift, and it's a linear relationship. Galaxies twice as far away move away from us twice as fast. Galaxies 10 times as far away move away 10 times as fast. In fact, you can plot this up on a graph, which we call the Hubble diagram. Hubble, uh, although a good astronomer, was even a better uh, self-promoter, some might say, and uh, almost everything to do with the expansion of the universe, although he played an important role, certainly not, not a total role in this problem, is named after him. So th this graph is called the Hubble diagram. This law is called Hubble's law. This line is called the Hubble line. The slope of this line is called the Hubble constant. And Slipher did most of the work. But anyway, that's, that's the way it goes. So if you plot up all these points of how fast is a galaxy receding as measured from the redshift in the spectrum versus the distance of a galaxy, you discover that this is a respectably linear relationship. And once you recognize this, you realize then that you can measure the distance to a very faint distant galaxy just by taking the spectrum. That is, if you take the spectrum of a galaxy, recognize that little pair of twin absorptions due to the calcium line, measure the redshift, derive a velocity, say, I don't know, 50,000 kilometers per second, you can then go over to the Hubble diagram, use the Hubble law, run over to the Hubble line, and say, well, if I measure a redshift of 50,000 kilometers per second, that must mean the galaxy is 3 billion light years distant. Or if I take a spectrum of another galaxy and I measure a redshift of, say, 70,000 kilometers per second, I come over to this graph, I infer the galaxy is 4 billion light years away. So Hubble's law provides the ability to get the third dimension by taking the spectrum of the galaxy. So the way one can construct this three-dimensional map of the universe is to take a large number of images of the universe to derive the left, right, and up-down coordinate, and then take the spectrum of each galaxy, recognize the absorption lines, measure the amount of displacement of those absorption lines, the amount that they're shifted to the red, come over to this graph, and derive the distance of the galaxy, and that's the third dimension. Work like this started in earnest about 12 or 15 years ago, but it goes very slowly because obtaining the spectrum of a galaxy is a torturous thing. To obtain the spectrum of the galaxy, rather than focusing all the light onto a photographic plate, a white dot, indeed you're dispersing the light, you're thinning it out and making it more diffuse and putting just a little bit in very many different places. So it takes a much longer time to obtain the spectrum of a galaxy. You can take a picture of a galaxy in just a few minutes. It can take many hours to obtain the spectrum of a galaxy. And so patiently going one dot at a time, it's very easy to measure the position in two dimensions. The third dimension is torturous. In all of the work that's been done thus far in the history of astronomy, there have been about 20,000 galaxy spectra taken. The most comprehensive survey that has come out thus far has emerged from a group at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And when it's plotted, it looks like this. 20,000 dots in three dimensions projected onto a two-dimensional slide showing you the location of 20,000 galaxies in the universe. What do we see? Well, it's not at all uniform. Our suspicion that if we could take an accurate census, we would find filamentary lumps and so is really vindicated. There are these very intricate structures. The black gaps on either side, by the way, are, are not a feature of the structure of the universe. That's just a place where they fell asleep and don't have any spectra yet. It's a part of the map that hasn't been filled out, so to speak. Um, it'd be much nicer to look at this in three dimensions. And so 
uh, we'll look at a video now that was actually done by an undergraduate here at the University of Washington last summer that plots these points, these observational points, in three dimensions and lets us walk through this diagram of the measured structure of the universe. If we could roll the video, please. You will see that this suspicion you have from the two-dimensional picture is true and that the, the, that the distribution of actual galaxies, one sphere per galaxy, is amazingly complicated. We see voids, we see lumps, we see clumps, we see bumps. We see occasional single ones. We see much greater agglomerations and so on. So we're on the right track. We're doing the right thing. But unfortunately, this survey of the universe made thus far surveys um, only about 1% of the observable universe. We've barely walked out of the neighborhood. The project that I'm going to tell you about today, instead of trying to survey 20,000 galaxies, has as its goal making a map of 1 million galaxies. Not only that, we want to do it before I retire. And so it's our intent to make this map of one million galaxies in just five years. We're going to do this using a special purpose telescope. The name of this grand project is called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It's named after the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, a philanthropic foundation located in New York City, who have been uh, a primary financial supporter of the project. The 100 scientists and technicians that I've mentioned are scattered across eight or nine institutions all across the United States and also in Japan. We've built a special purpose telescope to do this. The telescope is located in New Mexico on a mountain called Apache Point, uh, not too far from Alamogordo, New Mexico. Uh, if you stand down in the White Sands Missile Range and look up at the top of this mountain, it's a very precipitous rise to 9,200 feet. You see a little white dot all the way at the top of the mountain there. That's the location of the observatory. Here is the observatory itself. There are several telescopes located there. In the background is a telescope that is not related to the project I'm talking about today. This is a general purpose telescope with a mirror 140 inches or 3.5 meters across, also owned by the University of Washington in collaboration with five other universities. But the project that I'm going to talk about, this special purpose map, is this very modest, unassuming looking thing in this farm shed. The telescope is actually located here. This shed can slide back and retract to expose this rather odd-looking telescope during the night so that it can actually make its observations. You see here the shed retracted and the telescope as it will be when it's actually looking up at the sky. I'm using the future tense because this project is just about to begin. The hardware is completely constructed. Most of the computer programs are written. We will, on a time scale of just the next few weeks, start taking data with this special purpose telescope. The telescope itself is not very large. The mirror is only 100 inches across. That makes it about the 30th largest telescope, but it's a very special one. You can see that it's constructed um, in a very odd looking way. It looks almost more like a, a radar dish than a telescope because it's made to move across the sky very quickly and perform this very special purpose census. It will be used only for this project. It will operate for five years and then will be shut down. Well, what is so unusual about this telescope? The first thing that's unusual about it is the amount of sky that it will take pictures of, the amount of sky that it will image. The average very large telescope images a very, very small piece of sky. Most people are not actually aware of that. The amateur's telescope that's in the backyard can actually take a picture of a rather large piece of the sky. But normally, the larger the telescope gets, the smaller and smaller and smaller piece of sky that you can record in that telescope as an image. The typical large telescope used today records a piece of sky that is really very small. How small? Well, the full moon is about a half a degree across. If you look up in the sky at the full moon, you might think, well, it's one thumb's width. But if you put a protractor up there and you went from the left edge to the right edge, it's about a half a degree. The typical large telescope um, that is used today can image the size that's shown in a little square in the center of here, a little piece of sky that's only about 25% of the size of the moon. Now, if you think about how big the moon is in the sky, it's pretty small. And so when you take a picture with a typical telescope like that, you get something very, very small. You would have to, using a telescope like that, take one million images to blanket the entire sky. And that is not going to happen before I retire. So we've had to design a telescope that swallows a much larger piece of the sky at once. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope encompasses a much larger piece of sky, namely a piece of sky that is three degrees across, 36 moons across. And so you can see, can you see? There it is. 
Here's the little area averaged by a typical telescope, like the famous telescope on Palomar Mountain and so on. Here's the area of sky that's imaged by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So the first thing about this telescope that is unusual is it swallows a large piece of sky. The next thing about this telescope that is unusual is how we actually record the images. Most of the census in astronomy that have been done thus far have been recorded on photographic film. They're surveys of the sky like this, almost like a photograph that, that you would take of a, the scenery uh, outside your house. And each of the little lumps on this photograph is a galaxy of 200 billion stars. Well, this works well if you're not too concerned about exposure times, if you're taking bright objects. Something that is not realized by many people is that the photographic film process is very inefficient. When you aim light at photographic film, 99 out of every 100 pieces of light that hit the film do nothing at all. They just fall on the floor. They do not trigger the chemical process that exposes the emulsion. Only one out of every 100 pieces of light actually triggers something on a film. Now, if you're taking a picture of uh, your summer vacation in front of the lake, it doesn't matter. You can throw away 99% of the, of, the, of the light and you might not care. But if you want to take pictures very quickly of a huge number of objects, you need a much more efficient way of recording the data. There is a more efficient way to do this now, and it is a technique that has totally revolutionized astronomy. A movie that was very formative in my youth was a movie with Dustin Hoffman and Anne Bancroft called The Graduate that played in 1967. And uh, many of you who saw that movie might remember the very famous scene where the drunken neighbor comes over to congratulate Dustin Hoffman on making it through college and wants to give him advice on how to succeed in the world. And he says um, to this poor fellow, putting his arm around him and, and uh, breathing fumes on him. He says, Benjamin, I have just one word for you, just one word of wisdom. And what is that word? Does anyone remember? Plastics, right. He says, plastics. Enough said, right? Well, there is an equivalent revolution that has occurred in astronomy these days. There is one word in astronomy that says it all. There is one thing that you should invest in, and that word is silicon, right? The thing that has changed in astronomy is that we now use silicon to record images rather than photographic films. We use a piece of silicon called the charged coupled device that changes incoming light into electrical symbol, uh, signals, and it does it with astonishingly high efficiency, efficiency of approximately 80%. 80 out of every 100 pieces of light that hit this piece of silicon create an electrical signal rather than one out of every 100. So we can expose on the sky 80 times quicker. Indeed, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey will obtain its images in approximately one minute as opposed to one hour for the paper photographs that I showed you. However, the charged couple devices in the Sloan cameras are very, very special. They are huge. These CCDs can be purchased commercially in your home video camera, but they're about the size of your fingernail and they cost about $20. The uh, charge couple devices that you see here are the largest ever made. They measure um, about two inches across, as you can see. These devices cost $100,000 each. Here is one of them. There's a very large man over here named Guido who takes it away from me as soon as the, uh, as soon as the discussion is over. The largest cameras made in astronomy thus far actually contain four of these devices at $100,000 each. However, in the Sloan survey, to be able to montage the whole sky very rapidly, we need more than four. We need more than eight. We need more than 12. The Sloan camera head contains 30 of these devices. And as the expression goes, you do the math, right? $3 million worth of silicon in the camera head of this camera. This camera now exists. It's the largest, most intricate, and elegant astronomical camera ever made. It will do the imaging on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Now, we are also going to take spectra. The camera will be used to take images and derive the two dimensions. But to get the third dimension, we need to take the spectrum of every galaxy, measure the redshift, change that into a velocity, go over to the Hubble diagram, derive a distance to get that third dimension. We need one million redshifts. In Hubble's day, on a good night, Hubble might have gotten two spectra. To get those one million redshifts, of course, then it would take us 500,000 nights. These days, using more modern telescopes and charged coupled devices to expose the spectra on, a large telescope can take 10 or 20 spectra per night. We'd need only 50,000 nights 
to take one million spectra. The Sloan survey is going to obtain its spectra in an entirely different way, namely taking spectra a large number at a time, 640 spectra at once, simultaneously. There is a metal plate with a bunch of little holes punched in the plate. The position of those holes are derived from our two-dimensional images made with the camera. Into each hole is placed a little fiber optic tube. The 640 fuzzy galaxy images come up those fiber optic tubes and into a prism spectrograph. We record 640 spectra simultaneously for approximately one hour. Then we replace another plate with a different 640 holes in it, another 640 fibers, expose another 640 spectra. In a 10-hour night, we'll get 6,400 spectra, and in 200 nights, we will have 1 million spectra. So, in fact, in five years, we intend to obtain pictures of the entire celestial sphere that's visible from the northern hemisphere, plus these one million spectra. This will be a lot of zeros and ones, as you can well imagine. To be exact, the volume of data in this database will be 10 terabytes. That is one followed by 14 zeros. That's the amount of data in this database. But these days, it's getting rather, rather cheap to handle data like that. These data will be made available to the entire scientific community on the internet and to the entire world community, to the educational community, to the amateur astronomy community. For the first time, everyone will be able to work in the same data that the professional astronomer works from. These data can be brought into the classroom, these data can be brought into the physics laboratory. As well as studying large-scale structure, we will use them for a huge number of different projects. It'll be a paradigm change in the way many kinds of astronomy are done. These days, if you're interested in a certain piece of the sky because some funny object appears, you have to go out to a telescope and take a picture of the sky. After the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is completed five years from now, you'll be able to turn to your computer keyboard and bring up an image of that portion of the sky that has already been obtained and stored and processed and reduced for you. So there will be huge numbers of speculative projects which you would never dare waste a lot of time in the telescope with that instead now you will be able to try out because the data are there and waiting for you. We expect therefore to discover lots of serendipitous, lots of unexpected things. What kind of things? Well, I'll give you two just very quick examples of things that we found unexpectedly using this 3.5 meter telescope on the same mountaintop in New Mexico, operating it remotely over the internet. One example of a surprising thing is something that you all read about in the newspapers this morning and heard about on the national news last night, namely a titanic explosion, a gamma ray burst, followed by a fuzzy fading fireball of visible light that occurred last December. This event, has recently had its distance measured. It occurred roughly 12 billion light years away. The fading fireball was measured from our observatory in New Mexico. In fact, these measurements were made by two graduate students in the astronomy department here at Washington, Eric Deutsch and Alan Dierks. If we can see from 12 billion years away, this fading fireball, you can imagine that it must be pretty bright and energetic. Indeed, we now understand that these fireballs are the most luminous events in the universe. For the brief time that these gamma ray bursters are going off, there is more energy locked up in these events than the sum of the energy generated by every star in every galaxy in the entire universe a totally unexpected and serendipitous finding. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey will become sort of the quiet star map that all gamma ray burst astronomers will turn to to say, something appeared here. Did there used to be something there? Today the answer to that is, well, I'm not sure. I don't have a good image of the sky. Five years from now, the answer will be, I'll bring up that little piece of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and see. Let's go from the opposite end of the universe to something that is much closer by, but again, something done recently with our three and a half meter telescope to illustrate the diversity of projects other than large scale structure that the Sloan survey will do. Many of you perhaps remember just two months ago, there was tremendous excitement at the discovery of a relatively nearby asteroid called romantically um, 1997 XF11 
But the interesting thing about this asteroid was that a calculation of its orbit showed that it was likely to come very, very, very close to the Earth. Indeed, there was some discussion that it would pass closer to the Earth than our moon is with the possibility of a collision. Now, as more observations accumulated just a few days uh, after that, it became obvious that it is going to pass very close, but the probability of a collision is nil. It's going to, uh, uh, in all likelihood, in the year 2028, pass three or four moon radii away from us, three or four times the distance between the moon and the Earth. That's still an extremely close approach. Here is an image of that asteroid that was obtained the same day that this uh, issue was announced, uh, again, by a graduate student in our department at the University of Washington, Bernadette Rogers. This object is one million times too faint to see with the naked eye. And so it may look like just a little piece of fuzz, but you can see it crawling along with respect to the background stars, which are stationary. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey will discover a vast number of these near-Earth asteroids. So this is not just a project to plot the universe in three dimensions, although that was our original grand motivation for doing it, but rather it's going to be an encyclopedia of the sky that we use for a huge number of, of different reasons. Well, finally, in the last minute or two, I should, I guess, return to why we titled this lecture what we did, namely, The Cosmic Genome Project. Those of you who follow genetics are probably aware of the fact that there is a grand digital encyclopedia underway in genetics right now called The Human Genome Project, and it has certain remarkable similarities to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It is going to generate a vast amount of data, a map, of the human genome, of the arrangement of DNA in the human genes. The Human Genome Project will make approximately four, five, six uh, terabytes of data as compared to the 10 or 11 that the Sloan survey will make, about half as much data, but there certainly are comparable numbers. But they, they resemble each other in many other ways as well because the Human Genome Project will be the first ambitious digital map of the genome done in an automated, high-tech way. It will result in an encyclopedic map of the genome that will reside on computers and be available over the internet for a wide variety of purposes. Indeed, it's even the case that here at the University of Washington, we have a group in the Department of Molecular Biotechnology that is very actively involved in leadership roles in the Human Genome Project in exactly the same way that our astronomy department is involved in leadership roles in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So it's rather poignant and exciting that here um, we are living at this time where we are sort of mapping both inner space and outer space with these same high, high tech techniques that were not available to us until very recently, and then we will have this encyclopedic result that is available to all of us. It will revolutionize how both fields work, how both fields move forward. There will no doubt be major surprises in both of these projects in addition to the original motivation for making these maps. And perhaps most obviously of all, the real motivation of both of these projects is exactly the same, and that is to tell us about our origins. Thank you very much.